Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to the worship service. Good to see you this morning. Why don't we stand together as we prepare to uh, worship our God and our Savior, lifting up our praises to God and just uh, opening our hearts, uh, blessing God together this morning.
praise the God this morning.
And so as we sing, it's your breath that's in our lungs. How can we not just pour that out in praise to God?
and whatever it is that you uh, are in need of help this morning, of healing, of grace and of mercy. And God's love conquers all.
Awesome. Let's sing that chorus. Praise him one more time. Praise him for his love. You may be seated this morning, church. Thank you so much for worshiping your hearts out this morning and lifting up praise, even in the midst of fire and fury, uh, trouble and pain. There's something about having this love relationship with Jesus that we, uh, we can still praise him, even, even out of that pain, painful place in our lives. So we just give thanks to God this morning for that. So I want to draw your attention to the uh, Connect card. If you're a guest, would you grab one of these? They're in the pew right in front of you. And uh, this is a great way to get connected here at the church. Would you be so kind to fill this out, put your name information on it, stick it in the offering plate later in the service or one of the drop boxes on your way out. And Pastor Greg or Pastor Josh will follow up with you. And so we just invite you, if you're a guest, to fill out one of the Connect cards. Also, I just want to draw your attention to uh, birthday and anniversary cards in the lobby. You may have noticed this on your way in, but... On your way out, would you be so kind to stop by the table in the back there? And uh, there's a couple cards there. We send birthday and anniversary cards at the end of each month to our mission partners all over the world. So please take a moment and stop by. We love to fill those cards up with all the names that we can and let our mission partners know that they're loved, they're prayed for, and uh, we just want to draw your attention to that as well. So I have uh, a favor to ask. If you have a bulletin, would you grab these two items out of your bulletin? Put those in your hand for just a moment. We're in the midst of a campaign called Spending Our Strength. We're focusing for a number of weeks just through music, through the sermon series, through scripture, through prayer, and through giving, how we are called to spend our strength on behalf of the poor, on behalf of the marginalized, on behalf of those that often get cast aside in our society. Those are people that uh, there's a very tender spot in God's heart for, and so we as a church are called to do something, called to serve, called to give, whatever that may be. And so this morning, as you're listening to the sermon, as we we sing later in the service, we'll we'll have an offering. Would you just be praying about what's what's my part in this campaign? There's all kinds of great information there to tell you some of the things that we're working towards, some of the fundraising goals we have. There's an envelope in there that you can use or you can go online to our website, use the new PushPay app, whatever you want to do, some way to give, to be involved, to serve. So I'm asking if each of you don't think like, well, somebody else will do that. Right? Somebody else, maybe, maybe they have more means or maybe they're more able to serve in some way. Set that aside from them and say, what is God calling me to do this morning, in this campaign, in the midst of this, as part of this church community? So I just want to draw your attention to those things. Also, just a special invitation to you. This afternoon, we have a special uh, church meeting at 1 o'clock downstairs in the fellowship hall. And you may be familiar with Pastor Lily. There's some information in the bulletin uh, insert as well about that. She served our Chinese ministry for the fall semester and is looking to come back for a year. And we just have a, kind of a church business meeting to, to talk through that, pray through that, and to vote on that as well. So everyone's invited to come back at 1 o'clock today downstairs. Uh, at this time, Desiree is going to come and uh, lead us in a prayer and read our scripture this morning. Thanks, Desiree. Good morning, church. Please join me in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for the sunshine, and thank you for this opportunity for us to be together. Thank you for being our help, and thank you for being our hope. Dear Lord God, we bring before you at this time, each of us as individuals and collectively as a whole, that you may bless us and continue nurturing us with your loving kindness and mercy. We think of those amongst us at this time who may be of need. We pray, dear Lord God, that you, through us and others, will help meet their need. We pray for the sick, that you may bring them healing and comfort and strength. 
We remember those at this time who are mourning and grieving for the loss of loved ones. We pray that you may comfort them and strengthen them through their time of grief. Dear Lord God, we pray that you may bless our church business meeting that's happening today and that you may guide us in the next steps that we need to take as a church together. We thank you and we pray for your continued blessings for the leadership of our church, that you may continue blessing them as our church continues to blossom and grow in your word. Dear Father God, thank you for allowing our church and all of us as a community to be a light in this Amherst community. Dear Lord Jesus, we pray also for the leadership of our towns, states, countries. Dear Lord God, we pray that you may bless them with kindness to each other and justice so that we may walk closer to peace on earth. I pray, dear Lord God, that you may bless all leaders with a sense of humanity and humility. Dear Father God, we bring before you the young ones in our church, the children in our children's ministry, the youth, and also our college students. We pray that as they journey through their growing days and weeks and years, that you will continue to walk side by side them and bless their steps and bless their growth to be walking in your light. Dear Father God, as we prepare to hear your word, I pray that together we may open our hearts and our ears and our minds and our souls to the word that you have prepared for us and the ministry that goes with it. We pray also, dear Lord God, that you may bless the offering that will be given in your name to the expansion of your work. Thank you for your loving kindness and mercy. Amen. Please join me in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is on page 1146 in your Blue Pew Bibles. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, page 1146. Beginning in verse 1. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in, in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Thank you, you Nazarene. Preparing for this sermon series, um, I read several books and journal articles and blogs, and there was an article which I read that really captivated me. It was uh, published by Oxfam, which is an international coalition of about 17 relief organizations that are at work in 94 different countries. It's kind of a think tank for a coalition of a lot of different relief organizations. And through their re research, they revealed that the richest 62 people in the world have more wealth than the entire bottom 50% of our global population. 62 people have more wealth than a few billion people. 
Isn't that amazing to even think about? The inequity, the inequality that is so rampant in our world. Now, wealth isn't necessarily bad. Let's not have a dichotomy where somehow we view the things of this world or we view wealth as evil or wrong. We need capital for people to be able to start businesses so we have jobs or to have the capital saved to uh, attend college. And we hope that those of us who have retirement funds, that those funds are being invested wisely. But the challenge comes in how we accumulate whatever wealth that we have and what we do then with that wealth. How we accumulate the ethics in which we go about earning whatever amount of money it is, whatever resources that we might have. And if we have employees, how we treat those employees. It's also amazing then what we do with whatever wealth that we might have. And let's remember that just as we gasped at 62 people having more wealth than the bottom 50% in the whole world, let's remember that a lot of people in our world right now look at us and they say, boy, those are the wealthiest people that I can imagine. And that generations from now, I wonder if 10 or 12 generations from now, a pastor will get up and say, I read a study about the church in 2016. And they had this amount of wealth at their disposal, but this is what they did with it. See, it's a lot easier for us to, to condemn people out there than it is to look into our own hearts. And so to ask, am I investing my funds in a way that I'm at least doing the best possible that promotes justice rather than using people as commodities and tearing down their lives with injustice? The purchases that I'm making, am I striving to make purchases in a complex world that would honor God and that lead toward justice? Am I being generous with the resources that God has given to me? Let's go on a journey as the Apostle Paul, inspired by God's Spirit, speaks into this challenge for us of our financial stewardship. Join me in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It's in the Blue Bibles on page 1146. Now we need to understand the context to know what's happening. In the time that the Apostle Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, in what is now Israel and Syria and Jordan, there is tremendous political persecution by the Romans. There is uh, religious oppression and there's famine. There are people literally starving to death because of a huge famine that we know about both from the pages of scripture and also just from history. And so the Apostle Paul was such concern for these people whose lives are at stake, contacts the churches uh, that he's founded and that he has relationships with and he's raising funds to then be taken to these people who are oppressed and who are uh, hungry, who are in the midst of famine. And it's so similar to the spending our strength journey that we're in the midst of. Looking at how can we make sure that we have the resources to help people in our community who are hungry, who don't have funds to pay for their meds or or for their heat in the winter, or diapers for their babies. So, as we think about our global mission partnerships and funding them well. And so let's learn from this context God's wisdom for us and challenge for us. Join me in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 8. We read, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that has been given to the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial... Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. And I testify they gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability. The Apostle Paul is raising up as this example these churches in Macedonia, which was a Roman province to the north of Corinth. He's giving them a as an example of people who had extreme generosity to help to make a difference in the world in their generation. Now think about the motivation as we look at the first couple of verses. Were these people who had excess wealth? Were these people who were able to give because they had a good year in business? 
Did their accountants advise them not to move in the next tax bracket and to do some year in giving? Did they go to the back of their closet or up to the attic and find something they knew that they didn't want? And they gave it away and they felt good about being generous. That's not what these people did. We read that it is out of extreme poverty and oppression that they gave. I read some material from RSI, Resource Services Incorporated, that helps churches and hospitals and schools, nonprofits to raise funds. And just something caught my attention in this article. And it looked at each of the decades of the 20th century and asked, per capita, per the population, which decade had the most churches built in the 20th century? The 1930s through the depression. Because I think sometimes when we get complacent, we forget about needs around us. When we're comfortable, sometimes we just don't have eyes to see. But sometimes when we suffer, when we face trials, and we're in the midst of hardship, then we begin to notice needs around us. And God evokes us sacrificially to make a difference in the world. And it's so easy for us especially as we're acculturated materialistically in our culture to have a dichotomy of our faith. And that's exactly the challenge that verse 7 gives to us. Just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, complete earnestness, in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I think so much of what was happening in Corinth, this letter could have been written to the United States, to our culture. Because don't we excel so much in things like worship? We can go to almost any worship style, whether it's uh, beautiful classical instruments or it's a rock band with, with the fog machine. You know, we excel in every kind of worship that you could imagine that, uh, that we can participate. We excel in knowledge. We have Christian books that flood the market. There are Christian radio stations. We can go to Bible studies and we talk a lot about faith. We excel in talking a lot about our Christian faith, but, but so often in just consistent generosity. I think it's something that none of us even really want to talk about. And I don't think we really excel in this often in the North American church. Matter of fact, I wonder if subsequent generations, if one of the biggest blind spots of our generation will be that we had such resources at our disposal, but we were so busy increasing our standard of living that we forgot to increase our standard of giving and generosity in a hurting world. So I want to come back to just the basics of what God calls us to, and that's the tithe. That may seem like an antiquated word and concept, but in God's brilliance, tithe simply means 10 or 10%. And God called originally the Hebrew people, God's covenant people. We read about this in Deuteronomy and in Proverbs about giving of the first fruits. Now think of how challenging this was to those people. In an agrarian culture, take the first of your fruits, your vegetables, your grain of, of, of your profit. Take those first fruits, give that to God. Then with the remaining, establish a lifestyle based on that. And then look at proportionally how we might be generous with that as well. Isn't it a fascinating concept? It's like learning to make God number one. Now imagine with me if we treated so often the way our financial stewardship in our everyday life. So often with our financial stewardship, we really have a good heart. We want to be generous, but then we come to the end of the month and we're just like, man, there's just not much to scrape together there. So we have a good heart and then we get to the next month, the next month, the next month, and it turns into kind of a pattern. Imagine if we live life like that. Imagine... If I said to Carolyn, you know, Carolyn, at the end of today or the end of the week, the end of of, of the month, if I have some time left over, I'd be happy for us to spend a little bit of time together, right? That wouldn't go so well, would it? Imagine with my children. If I said, hey, kids, I love you, but you know what? If I have some time, the end of the day, the end of the week, you know, the end of the month, maybe we'll be able to spend, spend some time together, right? Those are kids who are not growing up in a healthy home. Imagine if you went into the classroom tomorrow and you said, oh, man, I had a great weekend. Professor, sorry, but I had such a great weekend. And by the end of the week, I I just didn't have time left. 
right, for that quiz or for that assignment. That would not go well, would it? Imagine when we're like that with God. God, I love you. I sing praise to you. But with my stewardship, you know, God, I, there just doesn't seem to be any left over. It's a challenge for all of us, especially because all of us probably feel financially pinched, part of which is because we're so acculturated to a lifestyle that we think we need to live that is in a materialistic culture and where advertisers are striving for us to buy stuff we really don't need and that we really can't afford. Now, why does God demand this, this thing called the tithe? By the way, just God's brilliance, you know, about a tithe. Because imagine if God gave us nothing tangible, said, just be generous. I don't know about you, but I'd give one half and one percent, and I'd be feeling pretty good about myself. Okay? So it's a foundation. It's something tangible. And yet God very carefully says, but don't just make that almsgiving where you just give something and then you move on and you live your life as if God doesn't have 100% of your heart. And so even at that 10%, we're still after that asking God, with this 90%, what will honor you and please you? And sometimes that means a change. Sometimes that will mean we'll feel like fasting. We'll feel some of the burden of the sacrifice and making some changes. But why does God demand this? What, what is this about? I think that there's a few things and then we'll move on. First of all, God wants to shape our hearts. God doesn't need our money. God could do all of ministry and meet every need far better than any of us ever could. And yet, what C.S. Lewis calls the divine delegation, where God chooses for us to incarnate the gospel life on life, in order to make a difference in the world. But God wants to shape our hearts. You know, anything that we invest in, we know if we're invested in a relationship, if we're invested financially in, in some kind of stock, if we're invested in our uh, education, if we are invested in anything, then our heart, we begin to think about, our heart begins to be shaped toward that. And the same is true with our treasure. Where our treasure goes, our heart will be shaped toward that. And God wants our heart more than anything else. The second reason that God calls us to tithe is because we live in a f world filled with such needs. That we live in a world filled with illiteracy and, and poverty and hunger and oppression and places where people are still to hear about the gospel, to still to know about God's love. We're also called uh, to be generous with our financial stewardship as a witness for Christ. You know, when, when God's people, when the church is generous, asking nothing in return, that grabs people's attention, doesn't it? See, generosity is one of the greatest witnesses for the gospel. And look at our motivation. I know some of us might be saying, man, why do, why do I need to make sacrifices like this? Join me in verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Think about how generous God is. Think about the beautiful world that we live in that God created. The snow-capped mountains or the roaring waves of the ocean or, or uh, the, the beautiful grassy plains. You know, whatever it is to us that, that just captivates us, it's breathtaking beauty. God has generously given us a world filled with such beauty. God has chosen so generously to give us the breath of life, this gift of life that God has given to us. God gives us minds to think. God gives us hearts to love, relationships. God gives us music to stir our souls. God gives us the arts to touch us deep within, food that's both delicious in all of its varieties and that also sustains us. We could go on and on and on. Think how generous God is. Because all of this was for us, that God has created. But then most profoundly comes the generosity of God in Christ, who was rich beyond measure, the wealth of heaven. And then Christ became poor when he came to earth. Imagine the poverty compared to heaven. We're trying to get from earth to heaven. Jesus went reverse. He was downwardly mobile. And he became one of us. And not only that, he lived in a family on the edge of poverty. 
in a land filled with oppression and violence, and he sacrificed his life on the cross. Why? In verse 9, we don't read, so that he might become rich. So that you and me. So that we who are spiritually impoverished might experience the wealth of God's love and God's grace, God's meaning and purpose for our lives, and the hope of eternity. Amen? Praise God. And so when we remember the generosity of God in Christ, how else can we respond but to want to walk in the footsteps of Christ and to learn to be a generous people with all of our life? In verse 11, the Apostle Paul comes back to this offering for for these starving people back in uh, Jerusalem and the ancient Near East. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what they don't have. Here's the difference between God's economy and our global economy. We talked about this a little bit last week. But so often in our world, it's about how much we have. And in God's economy, it's not about how much, it's how faithful we are with what God has entrusted to us. The fact that the Apostle Paul raised up the Macedonians as an example, you know, think about it. The Macedonians, I'm sure, gave far less than Corinth, not even close to what Ephesus was able to give, not even in the same ballpark as Rome. And Alexandria, I'm sure, gave more than all of them, and yet Macedonia is what's raised. Why? Because they sacrificially gave and their hearts were beating with the heartbeat of God. And it wasn't about the amount, it was about what they were able to do with what God had entrusted to them. Let me give you an example of this. As many of you know, last weekend was the FBC college retreat. I think there were a little over 70 students who participated in the retreat. It just are great things about, about the community and what God's spirit did when, when we create space for God to just work in our lives. But because of uh, a little bit of our budget gap, so our giving this year is about the same as last fiscal year, but together we estimated a higher target. And so because of that, uh, we've had to have spending caps. One of those things which was kind of in danger was college retreat. And then some of the recent alumni from the college ministry, those who just graduated like last year, the year before, the year before that, found out, I think that they began communicating. And I mean, here are students who are just starting careers. They're paying off student loans. And they began to give what they could. And that financed the college retreat so that every student, whatever their finances was able to come, and participate. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Wouldn't it have been easy for them to say, I just got, got out of college. I have all this debt. I'm, I'm working hard. I'm, I'm not making a whole lot yet. But they did what they could, and it all added up to make the difference in the lives of these college students. And so the Apostle Paul says, finish the work. And I want to challenge us, unashamedly challenge us. Let's finish the work of this spending our strength journey and then continue to be disciplined in our generosity, in our tithing. Or, and let me mention too, tithing, sometimes people can get caught up in it being all or nothing. Someday I'll tithe. Just start with what we can. Just start, just start this Sunday, next Sunday, with, with, with what we're able to do and, and set some goals, do some lifestyle changes, sacrifice some things, give some things up. I don't know, quit drinking as many lattes, cut down on our cable channels, whatever it is. You know what I mean? Uh, delay when we buy the next new car, buy a used car, or, um, you know, wait on, you know, the next device, whatever it is, okay? I know now, now I'm really getting into stuff, but, you know, whatever it might be, and we say, God, I'm joyfully willing to make this sacrifice and start today and move toward being consistent in tithing because that's your call of generosity. And so finish the work. I just want to remind us spending our strength, that we've invested $22,000 to keep the food pantry and to keep the shelter open. They would have both closed had we not invested that money to renovate the kitchen. 
Let, let's remember the food pantry a couple of years ago gave out without asking anything in return 82,916 pounds of food to people in our community. That in the homeless shelter, Craig's Place shelter, the last three years, a little over 230 people have stayed at least one night. And that about 35 so far have come into the shelter. By the end of the season, they've been in transitional or permanent housing, help finding jobs. They're on the way to rebuilding life. That because of, of our budget gap, that, that our giving's a little bit behind where we determined our target together. With budget caps, it means that things like Vacation Bible School and some of the hub ministries and fully partnering with our mission partners is challenging. Let's make sure that, especially for the emerging generation, for our mission partners, that ministries are fully funded. The third area of spending our strength is Freedom Cafe, a Christian ministry that's all volunteer. All the proceeds go to fight hu human trafficking. Some of you may have read in the devotionals that I've been sending out uh, about spending our strength about a 15-year-old girl named Nalia. Nalia's parents were desperate because she lived in a, just an impoverished context. And then they learned about a job for her in a city nearby. But what they didn't realize was that the people who were guiding her to that job were traffickers. And so this 15-year-old girl spent the next season of her life in forced prostitution primarily to Western men who wanted to have sex with underage girls. Then when she got sick, she was forced to work uh, 10, 12 hour days, six and seven days a week weaving fabric before a Christian ministry was able to help bring her out of uh, her enslavement, give her some vocational training, some, some, some Christian counseling, the love of God and restore her with her family. Freedom Cafe sends thousands of dollars every year to help battle human trafficking for the Nalias of the world. And then the fourth and final area of spending our strength is Pastor Lily. She just got her visa to return. She bridges culture so beautifully to invest in the emerging uh, Chinese generation. So many Chinese graduate students here. You know, years ago, if someone would have told me that there would be some of the 1% of China's leaders of the future all coalesced somewhere in the U.S. just waiting and hungry to be equipped, to be sent back to China and to the nations of the world, I said, no way. That's what God has orchestrated in our midst. And some of the best news is it's paid in full. Amen? Because Lily's home church was paying her base salary and the Chinese students, these, these, these are PhD students. Most PhD students I know aren't rolling in money, okay? And these Chinese students, these graduate students, instead of saying there's nothing that we could do, stepped forward and they've raised the remaining funds to cover all of Lily's expenses for at least the first year. Praise God. Let's finish the work. Let's do it by, by next Sunday, March 5th. Let's be generous so we can move forward fully funded in these important ministries. But why? What is this all about? What is God's vision? Look at verse 13 as we wrap up. And remember why and what this is all about. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you're hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. Think about this. There's so many different worldviews floating around in our global village. But rare is a worldview that gives equality in the dignity and the value of each person. Think about this. In some religions, because of reincarnation, our place in society, our caste has been determined because of our previous life. So if we're in the lower caste, we're getting what we deserve. We are lesser than others. In others where it's works oriented, we may obey the pillars of the law and that gives us a righteousness where we are religiously superior to other people and there's not equality. In what I'll call an atheistic worldview, an economic view of the world, it's primarily about who contributes to society 
And we've seen cultures like that, where those who aren't able to contribute are often devalued or even thrown aside. One of the things that I love about the ethic of Jesus, about the Christian faith, is that rightly viewed, each person is created in the image of God. And that means every person equally has dignity and value in the sight of God. How revolutionary this is. If we really believe that each person is created in the image of God, that there is equality of all peoples, we will work toward equality and justice with our last breath. Amen? Because that is aligned with the image of God, and that's a beautiful witness for who Christ is. So let me bring it all together about my own life. I grew up in a context where I had no idea who Christ was. And there's a guy in our hometown. His name's Ralph. Ralph worked at a grocery store. He worked hard. He was industrious. He worked his way up. He purchased the grocery store. Now he owns about three different supermarkets in my hometown. And as he began to, I'll say, acquire wealth, he and his family, I went to high school with his grandchildren, made a decision. They reached kind of a middle-class lifestyle, and they said, you know what? Right there, that's it. That's good. And so instead of buying the mansion on the hill, instead of having the most expensive cars, instead of jet-setting with the greatest vacations, they kept their lifestyle right there. And they gave everything else away. By the time that I came along, they were reverse tithing. They were giving about 90% of all of their net income. At First Baptist Church in my hometown, the church was aging, it was graying, and there was concern about the emerging generation. Ralph was concerned about that, so he generously gave money behind the scenes. None of us knew this till later. And he generously gave to pay the salary of a youth pastor. Evelyn was hired. My brother then was an atheist, okay? See, my brother in our family got, got the intellect, okay? But I got the hair, okay? Yeah. I think it's a good trait. So, so here's my brother who's an atheist, and these friends who are being discipled by Evelyn and the church, who are just thinking so intellectually and clearly and with such love about their faith, and that catches my brother's attention. And it draws him in, and he gives his life to Christ. He begins to share with me. I meet with Evelyn. First time I've ever heard the gospel. Go home that night. I receive Christ into my life. Trajectory of my life is forever changed, even though, thank God for God's grace, each step of the way. And you see, today, the trajectory of my life, and even being able to shepherd this congregation, you can thank Ralph. Because Ralph came to a place and he said, standard of living is just fine, thank you. We're going to raise standard of giving. And so I pray that we, and, and Ralph didn't one day wake up and do that. He had been doing the best he could to be generous when he was sweeping floors. I pray that we will be a people. Let's finish the work. Let's live a lives of generosity that someday we may look back and we'll have been part of this kingdom mission, this redemptive story of Christ. Amen? Father, we give you thanks that you've called us, even me, us, to your work. This work in the world of sharing your love, of holding the conviction of your truth, of helping to alleviate poverty, of advancing justice, of helping to see just those remnants of your kingdom's equality that is such a witness of who you are. So, Father, guide us to be a people who don't hold back. And not just now in this campaign. God, especially I pray for a lot of the emerging generation, a lot of the students. I pray someday, God, that I may stand before you and that you will say, look at these emerging generation who then went out and they were generous with their gifts and their resources, and they had an impact. It might have been far away. I didn't even get to see it, but I got to be part of it. May it be so, God. Guide us to be your generous people in the footsteps of Christ who sacrificed it all to bring us back home to you, we pray. 
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Church, as we receive our offering uh, this morning, we want to uh, welcome our Agape worship team. The Agape team leads worship at Agape uh, Ministry Saturday nights with college students. Uh, and so they're going to lead us in our offering song and also our closing song this morning. So let's give them a warm welcome this morning. Amen.
You know, imagine Saturday evening, the collection of 60 or 80 college students, and they've gathered to party. But this is a party of worship, a party of prayer, a party of community, a party of raising Christ up, and it is all student-generated. And thank you for the stewardship of your, of your gifts to bless the body of Christ in worship. May we go out as a people who are filled with Christ's light to repel the darkness in a world that is held in bondage to sin and brokenness and filth and depravity. May we shine Christ's light one life at a time. Amen. Hallelujah and praise God. Go with God's peace.